Hello, I'm Casey Aiken, and this is 21 This Week. With early voting beginning next week, we're going to handicap the important political races, and we're going to remember the 70th anniversary of D-Day, the capture of Rome, and the battle for the Marianas. Our panel of insiders will give you the story behind the story. We're joined by political consultant Susan Heltimus, Republican activist Jerry Cave, Breitbart contributor Eric Carey, and the president of Progressive Maryland, Elbridge James. Stay tuned for these stories and more on the next 21 This Week. Guess what, boys and girls? Early voting in Maryland primary elections begins next week on June 12th, and it's going to continue until the election day on June 24th. As the intimate nature of the election looms, the intensity in the campaigns have been stepped up. Debates have been held. Endorsements have been written. Now it's time to handicap the races. Susan, talking about the governor's race here, there doesn't seem to be that much enthusiasm in your party for any of the candidates. What's your assessment? Um, I, I think it doesn't have to do with the candidates. I think it's that it's a non-presidential uh, year and it's hard to get people excited. Although your governors run your state and your county executives run your county, um, people just don't realize. And a lot of people think we still have the September primary. And when the law was changed, there was no money to publicize it. But in the interim, as far as the governor's race goes, I am confident that Anthony Brown will pull it out. Elbridge, if this group of candidates were running at the Preakness, they would all be tossed out. Who's going to emerge out of the Democratic field? I'm sort of like what you're saying. I mean, the problem is in this race, you have a lot of people that have friends with everyone, and they're sort of not really wanting to put someone down over someone else. Anthony Brown's in the lead, but he, he needs to watch over his back. He's getting, they're catching up in him right quick. All right. Eric, there is a Republican race as well, and there's a contrast between David Craig, the Hartford County Executive, who has a solid record in government, and businessman Larry Hogan, who was in the Ehrlich administration, who was the flavor du jour. But who else might emerge out of this race? Uh, the other one who might emerge out of this is actually uh, Charles Lawler. Um, but more importantly, what needs to happen is that the candidates need to start actually talking to the people in PG County and in Baltimore City. Go where the Democrats are weak. Go where the jobs aren't. Go where property ownership is not. Go where people are concerned about their safety. Talk to them about that. Talk to them and actually not so much as talk to them. Talk with them and then listen. Ask questions and shut up and listen. They'll tell you what it's going to take to win. Thank you, Eric. Now, now Jerry, the last time a Republican won in Maryland, that was Bob Ehrlich, he kind of snuck up on the field and there was considered a weak candidate on the Democratic side. Is it possible we can see an upset this year? It's uh, a huge uphill challenge for a Republican, but there's a key to it. If the Washington Post would write the truth all the time instead of just some of the time, people might take notice. Here's what the Washington Post said, that O'Malley has taxed the life out of Maryland, leaving Virginia the spoils and that Democratic dominance in Maryland has led to bloat, incompetence, and corruption. If they would print that truth all of the time, then maybe a Republican, maybe we'd have accountable government. That's the key. It's not just that the, the how people are registered, it's that the Washington Post and the Baltimore Sun only print little speckles of the truth. If they did it all the time, it'd well, be a let, different story. Let's talk, let's talk about the, the, the race that's coming up in, in a week. Susan, who are, is Anthony Brown, as Elbridge is <laughs> suggesting, going to emerge victorious? Or is it really going to be a fight between him and Doug Dantzler? Um, it, it is going to be <coughs> close, I believe. I, I am confident that Anthony Brown um, will win. But it's going to be a matter in a race like this of who gets their voters out. And if you have a good ground campaign and you can flush out your voters 
you can win. But and that's going to be the what, secret. What I'm hearing <laughs> is that there's not a lot of enthusiasm. The reason I'm bringing this up is that the people that I talk to, and I talk, talk to Democrats and Republicans, there doesn't seem to be a lot of enthusiasm with the Democrats uh, you know, for either I, candidate. I don't think there's enthusiasm across the board. Pete, it is June. And you know what? People aren't used to voting in June. They're not but, thinking hold about on, we'll it. Hold on, Albridge. Albridge? Well, she, she mentions a good point. With a lack of enthusiasm, who's going to get their people to get the vote out? And I, I must admit, Anthony Brown has a better campaign staff in, in his fight. But that's not to say that the others are not trying to, to put themselves in position to catch up with him. It may be too late to do it, but Anthony Brown right now. Well, is I want to now, Jerry. I want to focus on the Republican race. But there's a great aspect right, of this go race. Go ahead. And what everybody is missing, and Doug Gantler and Brian Frosch are both going to find out, is that everybody in the state of Maryland hates Montgomery County, and Gansler comes from there, and so does Frosch. Mm -hmm. Brown and Cardin have better name recognition, and they're not All from right. Montgomery County. All right. Eric, but, you know, let's, let's look at it from this aspect, too. McCormick, a company that's been in the state for, since the 1800s, is leaving. That's a job creator that's leaving. Why? And they're looking at Delaware, and there's actually a bidding war for the company. And right there, that's right, that really says a lot about the environment here in the state of Maryland. Okay. We're going to find out. And don't forget, voting starts next Thursday for early voting. If you're interested at all, you can start next week. And you have two weeks to vote. All right. Locally, we got some contests between the current county executive, Ike Leggett, former county executive Doug Duncan, and the county councilman, Phil Andrews. And this has become a bit more energetic. On a recent debate on Channel 8 News Talk with Bruce DuPoit, it featured pointed exchanges between the candidates over spending, education, and transportation. Elbridge, conventional wisdom would say that Mr. Leggett should win but is there a possibility of an upset? No. The point, the fact is that uh, Doug Duncan, good man, and, and, and I, I like him a lot, uh, he's been away from the scene, okay? And, and he, the other opponents, you know, are, are, aren't enthusiastic about what they're trying to do. I, I think Ike Leggett has hit a lot of the key points along the way that will in keep his incumbency basically to, to, to move forward. Susan, I know you support Mr. Leggett, but objectively, what's your prediction about the race? And let me ask you this. Doug Duncan, when he left, was a fairly popular county executive, and he has a base that's different than Mr. Leggett's. Is there a possibility of an upset? Um, I think that's highly um, unlikely. And the, the, what has happened in the eight years since Doug left the office, Montgomery County has changed. We are now majority minority. And that is going to be a real detriment. And when you look mm. at the voters, the the percentage of voters that di weren't even around for Doug, it it has it changed. changed a lot. But and so and, and don't take out and don't take Phil Andrews lightly. No. He's 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 nibbling at the edges. Yes, and he so is. and well, this is this, that's a great point because I feel like Andrews is, is the candidate for people who are dissatisfied. It's sort of the Neil Potter of this election. Yeah. Th that it, it, Neil <laughs> Potter and, and um, Phil Andrews are very much alike in what they espouse and how they're going about this campaign. Mm -hmm. And with three candidates, if there were two, like there was with Sid oh. Kramer and <laughs> Neil Potter, um, there might be, you know, a possibility, <coughs> but since there are three candidates, he can't pull it off. Correct. Well, what I keep asking, Jerry, I want to throw this to you, is, is I keep wondering when the citizens of Montgomery County are going to get fed up with high taxes and, and you know, just this week, just last week, the, the county pa passed a new budget and it had a, an almost 9% increase in raise for firemen. It had an 8% increase in raise for police officers. And then it had a 7% increase in raises for general employees. Now, I keep asking the question, I'm not giving, being given an automatic raise in cost of living, and I'm, I, I, it frustrates me to see that government is so free and lax with our money. Where's the protest? The problem is people in Montgomery County do not pay attention to local politics. 
They don't know who they are. Less than 3% of the people could name you three locally elected officials in Montgomery County. They don't know who their delegates to Annapolis are. They get sold out in Annapolis, and they get sold out here in Rockville. They don't pay attention, and they get what they deserve. They get abused financially by the rest of the state, and the rest of the state takes their money and still resents them for Jerry, it. Jerry, you know what's interesting is I, th <coughs> I think there is a bit of a revolt on the Democratic side, and that is taking place in the House of Delegate races around the county. Mm -hmm. There is one spot, two spots open in District 20. Ten people are running. In District 18, there are three incumbents and four challengers. And I think, and in 18, where District I live. District 17. Yes. District the, 17. In 18, there is a lot of disillusioned voters. And that is a race that's going to be the bellwether to see if this changes This is the theater of the absurd. We have the largest population. We have the most delegates. We have the most power of any county. And when they go to Annapolis, they come back empty-handed because they don't even ask well, to be I treated fairly. I think it's going to change, Jerry. I you can think it's going to change, but for Jerry, decades they haven't done it. Well, right now we're, we're, we're losing track of what we're talking about, which is races in the county. And, and whether or not that whatever dissatisfaction that Susan feels is being tapped into is going to translate to county council races and to the race for county executive. It, Are people fed up? Eric. I, I believe people are fed up, but at the same time, it's kind of like um, someone has literally turned on a big giant bottle of Nova, uh, Novocaine where they go to sleep and all this stuff happens where the wisdom teeth get pulled and then afterwards they're like, ooh, what happened? But they don't actually act on the pain that they're experiencing when they actually have the chance to do so in the, voter, in, in, in the voting box. I don't know what will happen in November, but there could be a new council person at large there could be a change in District 1. In District 5, there will be a change. In District 3, there will be a change. But, 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 but change doesn't mean that they're going to do it. Right. I think you have to give them a break, Jerry, and but, let's talk again oh, next. But the, the issues, 50 the years, issues are nothing. still the same, but you don't hear the candidates talking about those right. issues of pain. Eric is correct. And, and, and that's but, where Eric, the catch Eric, is. Eric, you're overblowing this, this issue of pain. I think if there was this great issue of pain, you wouldn't have that many people in Montgomery County, and you wouldn't have that many people being satisfied with what they're getting for services. Well, they they are dissatisfied right now. Our our educational system we're starting we're slipping on our scores. We look at the uh, basically employment, and right now we have a lot of people that are underemployed instead of being overemployed. So right there, we have a lot of people that are going through that right there on on top of. We're getting ready to start we're hitting. We're coming out of a great recession. We're coming out of a great recession, okay. but you, you, don't, you don't come out of a great recession on your knees crawling. Un the unemployment w rate in Montgomery County is going down. I believe it's now at 4.2, which is, you know, the lowest it's been in a long time. But then you also, but you also look at what's happening when it comes to the other side of the, that whole equation with the immigration part. We actually have people now that are coming here because they're hearing back in their own countries that they need to come here and bring their kids with them. That is actually going to turn into a drain on our systems here in the county, both educationally, well, the, law enforcement, and, and social services. Around the county, you can't do that. You deal you stop, with what you've got. But, but when you're hunting for deer, you put out salt lick. Take away the salt lick, and deers will find some place else to eat. And well, the other thing is, Maryland and Montgomery County especially is a one-cash crop state. It's like a banana republic. If the federal government stops the, the, the flow of money, we're in huge trouble. All right. This has been interesting. But we, we, didn't, we didn't hit the question. The question was, who's going to win as county, count, county council executive? You two think Ike Leg is going to Correct. Gonna, gonna win. Correct. Leggett. Same. We'll find out. We've got, we got two weeks to find out. As we go to break, I want to talk to you about, if you'd like to learn more about the candidates, you can see my interviews of candidates Leggett, Duncan, and Andrews on the Montgomery Community website or on YouTube. When we come back from this short break, honoring the 70th anniversary of D-Day. And welcome back. As we film this segment of 21 this week, we're remembering what has been called the longest day, the 70th anniversary of the Normandy invasion. And while the importance of the Allied invasion into German-occupied France cannot be denied, we shouldn't forget, and we should also remember, that June 6th is the longest day for other reasons. 
World War II was not just about the European theater of action. America was involved, involved in a world war, fighting on many fronts and many foes. Military actions that day took place all across the globe and in all different time zones. In the Pacific, the United States forces began the campaign to take back the Marianas Island chain with the invasion of Saipan. That effort resulted in nearly six months of brutal and deadly combat in the air, on the sea, and in the land. In Europe, the campaign to liberate Italy and begin to drive, uh, drive out German troops culminated on June 6th with the capture of Rome. Now, I think the importance of this day in history is not marked just by the heroic actions that took place that day on Normandy beaches, for there are many heroic battles throughout the world history. To me, the ultimate importance of D-Day is that it led to the defeat of an evil, tyrannical rogue nations and the transformation of enemies into allies. So I'm going to ask our panel what they think should be remembered about June 6th. Start with you, Eric. What should be remembered is that this day was the beginning of the new United States. This is where we became a true, true world leader, where our men and, and, and our troops literally were going against insurmount insurmountable odds. And what is, you hear these stories and what we need to start doing is we need to start talking to these guys and, and, these, and our veterans from that time and listen to some of these stories. These stories are not in print, they're not on record, they're not on cassette, they're not on 8-track. They're, they're in the memories of these, these guys. And some of these stories are really, really strong stories that, you know, that are going to be lost. And this is what was really, truly important about that, that war, that memorial that we have down in D.C. When you get a chance, stop. Thank those guys, because if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be here today. Thank you, Eric. Albert, what, is, what do you think is important about honoring and remembering D-Day? D-Day was to Europe like uh, Midway Island was to the Pacific. There were a lot of battles going on. But the fact is that D-Day was a time when we cracked the, not, the Nazis in Europe. Yeah, it helped out. D-Day helped out in, in Italy because it took the forces that might have been in Italy over, over to France. And that our average Joe and Jane put their efforts forward to make this a better nation it needs to be remembered. It wasn't, it wasn't the generals. It was the average soldier that won that war for us, and we need to reward them for it. Thank you, Albert. Susan, what do you think is important about why we remember D-Day? Um, I learned a little of a factoid today that put everything in perspective. War has changed, as we know oh so well since that day. But on that day, one day on the shores of Normandy, more Americans were killed than in the war that has gone on for 10 years in the Middle East. And I think that is amazing when you put it all in perspective. The human sacrifice was over and we should be ever so grateful for those valiant men. Jerry, what's, what's, what do you think is important about honoring D-Day? We would have still beat the Nazis if, if uh, D-Day had not been successful. And uh, assault on a fortified beach is about the hardest thing you can do. But what it meant was is that the Iron Curtain was going to come down at the Elbe River and not come down at the English Channel. We would have still beaten the Germans, but the Russian army would have been the dominant army on the continent, and that would have really made winning the Cold War, which was done by Ronald Reagan, led by Reagan and the Republicans, that it would have been so much harder. So it isn't that it just helped to defeat the Germans sooner. It also enabled us to be in a position to win the Cold War. Well, thank you, and, and I think all of these are, are great valid points. You know, Eric, it's too bad that those who, sur who survived D-Day are now in their 90s, yeah. and there's very few still remaining. So it's important that we capture their thoughts. Uh, and to, to your point, Elbridge, the, it is the individual soldier who won, but we, it was really a transformative battle that transformed, I think, us as a nation not, and what the out ultimate outcome was going to be. We no longer fight to conquer, we fight to liberate. And that's a remarkable and, wonder, and, one, and wonderful thing. And I think we as Americans should take pride in that fact, that we're, we, ha we have a different philosophy, and it's because of our internal obligations that we have as democratic people
governed by ourselves. All right, we got we got a break. Stay tuned for Parting Shots when we come back. Now with Parting Shots, Susan Held. Um, as Casey said, early voting starts next Thursday. Early voting goes from June 12th through June 19th from 10 in the morning till 8 at night at nine locations. I would advise all voters, get enthusiastic, pick up the League of Women Voters magazine. They ask every single candidate in Montgomery County, Democratic, Republican, Independent, whatever, to fill out a questionnaire. You should go here. If a candidate didn't bother filling out the form, maybe they're not worth voting for. But everything is here. Get your League of Women Voter Guides. Thank you, League of Women Voters. Thank you, Susan. Jerry Cave, your parting shot. I'd like to go back to D-Day and salute a local component, two sets of that. On a large scale, the 29th Division, the Blue-Gray Division, came out of Maryland and Virginia. They hit the hardest beach on D-Day, and they went all the way through Europe. That division suffered 200% casualties. On a more specific level, we had a local person in we lost a couple of years ago named Vince Boggy, and he had been the beach master at D-Day, and when that was over, they sent him to the Pacific. It was rare to be in both theaters. And I asked him, because after that he was a beach master at Okinawa, and I said, how was it? He said, I wasn't scared at D-Day, because he didn't know what to be scared of. He goes, I was petrified at Okinawa. I'd like to salute all the men and women who served, the 29th Division, and Vince Boggy. Thank you. Eric, Kerry, what is your parting shot? First, I'd like to say thank you to all the vets, but um, let's also, we, we had an event that happened this week where a uh, soldier was returned home after we made a, a tragic deal with five horrible humans that are now back out in the, in the free world. And we still have a Marine that is left behind in Mexico. Let's not forget him. I would have rather seen him come home and I would have been really excited about him coming home before who did come home. So uh, let's not forget the Marine in, in Mexico. Thank you, Eric. Elbridge James, your parting shot. Well, I've got two parting shots. One is the fact that let's not prejudge the, the soldier who came home from, Af from Afghanistan. Let all the record get sold, get, get told before we say anything. But also want to be closer to home. I'd like to thank the people in Montgomery County. This county has been so supportive of all peoples of color, no matter white, black, or whatever, that for the first time we've had 31 African Americans run for office, Republican and Democrat. And, and so that's the highest number we've ever had. That says basically anybody can feel comfortable and, and, and assured that they can run for office to represent us here in Montgomery County. I'm not supporting any of the candidates, but I'm saying the environment here is very conducive to be free to run for office. And I'd like to thank the people of Montgomery County for that. Thank you, Elbridge. In fact, I think that's a great point to end this day on because I think we sometimes forget because we grumble about everything and we pick apart all of the, all of the budget stuff and should we be living here, should we be living here. Montgomery County is really a wonderful place to live and we all want to make it just a little bit better and that's why we grumble and that's yes. why we pick and that's why we fight. That's why we have so much fun on our show every Friday night. So panel, I want to thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for giving of your time and thank you audience for tuning in to Montgomery County's hardest hitting political talk show. And remember, you can follow all of the election coverage by linking to us on Facebook and on the Montgomery Community Channel. And you can follow us here at 21 This Week on Twitter, and you can watch us on YouTube. So for 21 This Week, I'm Casey Aiken.